Good evening. I'm uh, Dr. Eugene Barnes, and on behalf of Pastor Thomas W. Miller, I greet each and every one of you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, many of you may have been expecting to see Pastor Miller this evening, but he is away on official business, and he has entrusted the lesson to my care tonight. Um, I want to thank each and every one of you, uh, especially those members from uh, Champaign-Urbana and also uh, the New Life Church of Faith in Danville. Uh, I want to give uh, thanks to Minister Kara Clark. Uh, technology is great, and uh, Minister Clark, you have been instrumental in helping us get to this uh, fray point. Uh, in spite of our distances, we remain closer through technology, uh, but science will never replace the spirit uh, that moves us on to excellency. And so let us just have a word of prayer before we begin. Uh, Father, as we enter into eternity with you, we acknowledge before heaven and earth that you are our God and we are your people. We implore you right now, Father, to allow your Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, let it illuminate us. Uh, let us catch the light of Christ and let us reflect the light that we catch. And Father, we pray that you will guide us and protect us and that you will, when we are wrong, that you will correct us. We ask, O oh Lord, Father God, that you be with us right now. Guide us, O oh Father God, and we shall remember to give your name the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We're moving into a different arena uh, this evening. Uh, we're going to be looking at chapters 8, the prayers of Daniel. Um, there's, uh, this, is, this, is, this is going to be uh, an interesting foray uh, this evening. And I just want to say to you that uh, you might be a little bit blown away. And for those of you who have rubber bands, you put the rubber bands on your socks because you might have your socks knocked down round by your ankles. Amen? Now, I'm just assuming that most of you have the lesson. There may be some, for whatever reason, who do not have the lesson. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to attempt uh, reading tonight, at least the first page or so, and then we will go into an exposition of, of this lesson. Amen? No one can believe how powerful prayer is and what it can affect, except those who have learned it by experience. Whenever I have prayed earnestly, I have been heard and have attained more than I prayed for. God sometimes delays, but he always comes. And this is from Martin Luther. Amen. Uh, in the previous chapter, we saw how Esther was divinely positioned by God to exercise the dominion mandate in prayer and gave favor with King Asahurus through the weapons of fasting and prayer. By taking authority through corporate intercession, the people of God were divinely enabled to destroy the evil plot of the wicked and execute the judgments of Elohim in both a spiritual and a generational battle. The weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, but we must be willing to exercise our dominion mandate by inviting God to get involved in the affair and bring God on the scene for her position as queen. In this chapter, we will see Daniel, who is a slave in a foreign kingdom, but his position in the earth is what makes him a mighty weapon in the hand of Elohim. Behind the scene, and cause angels to come in response to his prayers. It is the prayer of Daniel that brought into manifestation the prophecy of Jeremiah the prophet concerning the end of the captivity of God's people. Jeremiah prophesied that the captivity of God's people was going to last 70 years, and it took the strong, persistent prayers of Daniel to overthrow the satanic embargo in the heavenlies through angelic intervention and reinforcement. You are about to encounter the life of one that believed in prayer and saw a manifestation of answered prayers. The prophecy of Jeremiah was recorded and kept in the scrolls in the temple, 
And at the appointed time, Daniel began to study the scrolls and found out that the captivity of God's peoples was supposed to last 70 years and the time had come for their deliverance. The prophecy is found in Jeremiah 29, 10. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. But the prophecy was conditional. Daniel saw that the time was finished and the prophecy was not fulfilled. There was a clause written in Jeremiah 29, 11, 12 that needed to be met before they would be a manifestation. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of end, to bring you, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me and ye shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. The prophecy expressly said, that God would hear their prayers, but that wouldn't be the solution to break the captivity. He wanted them to prepare themselves through prayer before there was to be a release from captivity. It wasn't going to be easy. They would have to seek the Lord with all their heart. Uh, that's enough reading, and, and we need to drill down into this lesson tonight. And uh, as we unpack this lesson tonight, uh, there's a question that I would pose to you that I would, would that you would consider. And that question is, what are God's intentions that are hidden in the action of the enemy? And let me repeat that now. What are God's intentions that are hidden in the action of the enemy? And now we find De uh, Daniel and his countrymen who are Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. Now, I know, uh, you know, a lot of preaching has surrounded itself around uh, calling those three comrades of Daniel, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the truth of the matter is that those names were the name of Babylonian gods, not the, uh, the God-given names that they had of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. All right. So, so Daniel and company, they find themselves um, in Babylon, but the Babylon of Daniel's time is not the Babylon uh, that we need to consider at this point. And so what we need to do, we need to look back a few thousand years to Babylon of old, the Babylon that the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah had prophesied would be utterly destroyed by God. And I want you to hold in your memories the questions that I ask you. What are the intentions of God that are hidden in the action of the enemy? The story of Babylon sets the stage for the shaping of the world and also the rise of a people that are obedient to God. Amen? Now, God has just destroyed the world by flood. Uh, and, you know, the, the hearts of man were deceitful at this time. And may I submit to you that sin was not the only reason that the flood came. There were some creatures that God needed to get rid of, and we might have an opportunity uh, to question that uh, in, in a few moments. But uh, the, right after the flood, men began to build a tower to heaven. This tower was, was made to invade heaven and if, and, and if possible, overthrow God himself. Amen? But there's another question. Whenever I read the, the Bibles, I always have these questions. I have a PhD in theology, but uh, that don't help you too much when you come to the Bible because you have to resolve some of these questions. And so a lot of times I come away with more questions than answer. But the, the question that we're poised with right now is that how could fallen men, ignorant of a God, uh, after being expelled from the Garden of Eden, who had no knowledge of God because that golden spiritual umbilical cord that men first had with God was disconnected when Adam sinned. Amen? 
And so suddenly we have uh, men that possess the wherewithal to suddenly not only acknowledge a God, but be cognate of where God lived and mounts a feeble attempt to, God, to invade God's very presence and threaten God's sovereignty. That's a question. How did ignorant man know? May I submit to you that Psalms 82 will give us a hint. I'm going to read Psalms 82 for some of you, and then I'll just explain it uh, as we go along. Psalms 82, it says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth amongst the gods. Now, the gods here in the Hebrew are Elohim. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked, Selah? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Read them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. So, Psalm 82 gives us a hint of trouble in paradise. Uh, where God is holding a council meeting with the sons of God. And in the Hebrew, the sons of God is rendered benah Elohim. Now, God is chastising these little guys, and that's what they are, the little guys. These supposed leaders of men for failing to adhere to heavenly policy, and God tells them that they should die like men for their treachery and treason against heaven. Now, please note that these sons of God, these Benaha Elohim that are mentioned in Psalm 82 are part and parcel of the same sons of God that is mentioned in Genesis 6 and 4. Uh, for some of you Bible scholars, you remember that uh, Genesis 6 and 4 speaks to the fact that uh, the daughters, the sons of God, found the daughters of men to be fair, and they made it with these women. They had children, and these children were what was called Nephilims. They were the product of uh, the sons of God, the Benachah Elohim, and women, and they became the Nephilims. And the Bible called them that they were giants in those days. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, here we have a peculiar situation that we have uh, uh, something that was not ordained by God. And if you go over to the book of uh, Jude, it will also mention these same Benaha Elohim, these sons of God, that the Bible says they kept not their first estate. Now, what that means is that these angelic beings, and I would rather call them celestial beings because not all of God's counsel of celestial beings are angels. The word for angels is malik. And then the, the name for these sons of God, the Benachah Elohim, and then we have the living creatures. And so we have different categories of celestial beings. But over here in the book of Jude, these angels which kept not their first estate, what is this referencing is that these angels took off immortality and put on mortality in order to be able to deal with women. And so earlier when I said that sin was not the only reason for the flood, the other reason was to get rid of all flesh, including these Nephilim. So, God had entrusted some of his celestial beings, his family of little gods, to assist him in ruling the earth. Uh, remember, uh, let us make men. Uh, that was the sons of God. Uh, some have erroneous thought it was uh, Elohim, which is in plural in this instance, means God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Well, they were all involved in this, but it also involved these sons of God, these Benaha Elohim. And so, uh, what happened was when God had allowed these lesser gods to rule, uh, they blew it. And God was pronouncing judgment upon them in, in, in Psalms 82. And God has decided to do a new thing. Now, mind you, 
the Tower of Babel also was in Babylon. Amen? Uh, we're, we're, we're working our way back up to Daniel, but I had to take you back a few thousand years to build the history to show you because I've asked you a question, what is the intention of God that is hidden in the action of the enemy? Now, uh, the, the, the Tower of Babel, uh, the men had acquired enough information that they were going to go to heaven, which was not going to happen. Because what God did, he confounded the language of the men. Uh, there were some that spoke Italian, Mamma Mia, amen? There were some that spoke German, the Ghetto Zuhausa. Uh, there were some that spoke Kiswahili, Sijambo Habarigani Nawewe. Uh, there were some that spoke Spanish, Ase Poco Que Lo Vi, uh, Allí en La Iglesia. And this is one that Pastor Miller might like. Uh, some spoke we oui, we oui, majeure. Amen. So uh, I need to take you to Deuteronomy 32 right now. And some of you who have a pen, you should be writing some of this down so that you can study it later on. Just don't take my word for it. Be like the Bereans. Search the scripture and see if what is said is so. 32, we're beginning at that 7th verse, and uh, you don't have to go there right now, but, you know, when you get a chance to just later on, you could uh, refresh your memory on this. It says, remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance. Get that now. When the Most High, meaning Jehovah God, divided to the nations their inheritance. When he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Now, for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Well, what, what is being said here? After the flood, and then after the rebellion in, um, in, uh, in, in, at Babel, God is disinheriting the nations. He is assigning the rest of humankind to the Benacha Elohims. And as I told you, God is getting ready to do a new thing. He leaves mankind under the rulership of these lesser gods, and he chooses for himself a champion straight out of the heart of the rebellion of Babylon. We're moving along in Babylon. God chooses Abram out of Ur of Chaldea, which is in southern Babylon, to be his new and best champion. Now, it would not have been my first choice to choose a man out of a rebellious and treacherous and uh, a treasonous uh, uh, stronghold and choose him to be a champion. And this is what separates God from men. Uh, his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And so God does a new thing here and God proceeds to demonstrate his awesome power to the fallen celestial beings by raising up from the dregs of society and promoting him to be earth hero. Now, not only does God confound the wisdom of the onlookers, but he does something else that he's never done before. Now, when God called Abram, Abram was obedient. I say Abram was obedient to God and following his instruction. Maybe I'm talking to somebody here. See, uh, when, when God called Abram, he told Abram to get out of his country and go to a place where God would show him. Now, he go Abram, Abram picked up his church bag and he's hidden for the city gate and his coat is flapping in the wind. And as he's moving to get to the city gate, to get out of the city, he finds that he has a friend with him, which is his nephew, Lot. 
When you start living righteously, other folks is going to follow you. It's hard for us to be able to compel other people to come to Christ when we're not living holy. The Bible says God is holy, so we ought to be holy. I'm preaching y'all. If we're going to have any access and we're going to have any provisions from God, we're going to have to live holy. We just can't talk about it. And I know we can talk real good scripture, but we've got to do uh, a whole lot more. Amen? So now, God is getting ready to demonstrate his power, and he's getting ready to do something he has never done before. And it just blows people's mind because Almighty Jehovah God makes an unconditional covenant with his champion, Abram. Now, Abram and God has gotten tight. God has made not only an unconditional covenant with him, but God made the covenant so that Abram would understand it. Now, if I can remember correctly, uh, it's in Genesis, and, and my memory may not be all, be all that good, uh, but it's in, in Genesis where God tells Abram uh, how he's going to make this unconditional covenant with him. Now, uh, back in the day, what they had was uh, they made an agreement and it was called a baroth in Hebrew. And what it meant was to cut a covenant. And it was a blood sacrifice where they would take an animal and they would cut it in half or several animals and cut it in half. And then they would stand between them. Now, the import of that was whoever broke the covenant would be killed and cut. And so here God cuts the covenant, Barath, he cuts the covenant, this unconditional covenant with Abraham, which meant that if God broke the covenant, he would kill himself. None of that was going to happen. And so here Abram has an unconditional covenant with God because of his obedience. Now, this is something strange that happened with Abraham. Now, Abraham, the, the, first, the first Jew, was a Gentile. It was Abraham. He, he wasn't a Jew starting out. He was a Gentile. In fact, the family he came from wasn't all that reputable because the Bible says, not Barnes, the Bible says that God called Abram out of an idolatrous family. What is idolatry? Well, we, we know what idolatry is. Uh, when we uh, worship things, like uh, when we should be uh, in church, we washing our brand new cars. That's idolatry. Uh, we worship idolatry when we have these symbols. Now, I'm not talking about anybody, but, you know, there's folks got this big, you know, Buddha, got that big belly. Some have that in their house and they put, a, what you call it, incense with it. And, and, and that's idolatry. Another form of idolatry is when you run along with something and you believe that God is in it and God don't have anything to do with it, that's idolatry. Amen? So there's a different forms of idolatry. And we, we've got to be careful. Uh, uh, the God that we know is a jealous God. Amen? So God makes this unconditional covenant with Abram. Now, God is omniscient. He knows everything at all times, and he knew that Abraham and the people that would come from Abraham was going to sin, but yet God made an unconditional covenant with him. There was nothing, it was unilateral, meaning that there was nothing that Abraham had to do. He had already done it by his obedience, through faith. He was the father of faith. When you go back and you look at the Bible and, and, and you start back in Genesis after Adam fell, from the time of Adam to the time of Abraham was 2,000 years. Now, between that 2,000 years, you will find other men that God tried to deal with. But it was only with Abram that he was able to establish the foundation of faith. Amen? Here's the thing with God. Once God calls you to do a thing, and then you don't do it, then God moves on to the next person. Amen? So, God has made this unconditional covenant with Abraham. What did that mean? It meant that 
even though God knew that Israel was going to sin, and I mean sin a lot, because there was the two major sins, the two major sins that that that, that Israel did that God punished them was one was breaking of the Sabbath, and the second one was idolatry. Those were the two main sins that God ended up punishing and sending um, Israel into captivity. And so now God has made this unconditional covenant with Abraham. So Paul says in the book of Romans that all of Israel will be saved. And when you look at that, you'll question it because if you don't understand the dynamics of this unconditional covenant that God has with uh, his favorite people, which is he called, in, and I believe it's in Proverbs 7, he calls Israel the apple of his eye. Now, let's not get it twisted. The church, um, thank God, has come about due to the fact that um, Israel has sinned and God wanted to bring in the church in order to make uh, Israel jealous. Of course, we've done a very poor job of that. Amen. Uh, myself included in there. Amen. But um, Paul says that all of Israel will be saved. And so what I'm saying is that even though Israel has sinned, amen, uh, Abram had this unconditional covenant with God, but that didn't mean that they won't get punished for their sins. Again, the question that I posed to you earlier that you're supposed to be retaining in your memory, we're getting to understand that the invasion is to be understood as an act of God. We're having some technical di difficulties here, but we're going to get through this. Y'all continue to pray with me and pray against the spirits because they don't want this message to get out. I've mentioned a few things. I know they don't want to be heard, but I'm going to tell it. See, God could have put this message on the wind, but he called the little colored boy from St. Louis and say, go tell it. And I'm going to tell it. So, we ask the question of what is God doing? And God is purging his people and the invasion is not to be seen as an attack of the ungodly upon the godly, even though Babylon is ungodly. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar is ungodly. So now we, we've gone full circle. We, we, we went back several thousand years and, and here we are. We're finding that God has sent King Nebuchadnezzar uh, to punish Israel and bring them to Babylon. And so our lesson is in those of you who have your Bible, you should have your Bible. You should, you should always have your weapon. Amen. Uh, I like to keep my weapon. Of course, whenever I'm in, in, in church and especially when that pastor is preaching, uh, what I like to do, I like to take notes. I don't have photographic memory and I like to be able to remember what the pastor is saying for later on. See, preaching and teaching should be married. And those of us who are ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ and New Life Church of Faith, we should be mimicking what the pastor is telling because in, in the teaching. Now, you see, when you understand the Bible, you understand that Jesus, he preached 15 percent of the time and he taught 85 percent of the time. We should be doing more teaching than preaching. Amen. So here we are right now. Uh, in the book of Daniel, and we've arrived, and uh, it says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, going back to that question, what are the intentions of God that are hidden in the act of the enemy? Now, Remember, I said that the attack is not to be seen as an attack of the ungodly upon the godly, but rather it is a call for internal reformation. And here in Babylon, with the presence of Daniel, Hananiah, Misha, and Azariah, it's going to be an announcement to the world of God's worldwide plan. God takes the worst that there is, a demonic stronghold for several thousand years. He picks out of it his champion. You know, the old folk call him a champion, but his champion. And he picks him a champion and he makes him the father of a nation. 
what God would do that. And I wouldn't serve a God that couldn't take somebody out of uh, the heart of a rebellion and reform him and set him up to be a leader of a nation. And so God is doing it. God has brought Daniel and these young men. Now, let me read something. I'm going down to that third verse. And the king spake to Asphanaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes. For children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding, science, and such had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. We're back in Babylon. We're back in Ur of Chaldea. We're back where Abram initially came out. We're back in Babylon where Babel was. Amen? And so now the king has desired to take certain of the Jewish young men. Now, these were still boys because it says children. Uh, uh, for those of you who remember uh, there is a exercise in the Jewish faith that is called the bar mitzvah. Once a young man turns 13, he has a bar mitzvah. And in that bar mitzvah, uh, he passes from childhood to manhood. So when I'm looking at this text here, and I'm seeing the way that the text is written, then we have to understand that these are still young boys. Young boys with the mind of their own that end up resisting the uh, the advances of Nebuchadnezzar to change them. The first attempt was to change their name. You know, if you can change the person's name, you can change their mind. Amen. I remember back 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 in the day. Uh, you know, everybody had a name on the street that identified you. I'm not talking about what your 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 Christian name, your birth name was. You had a name, and that name sort of stuck with you to describe who you was. Amen? Uh, and, and I'm not going to mention them, but I, I know some of you sitting back there, and you're just thinking, well, you know, I remember they called me this and that and other. Well, yeah, they did. But a name identifies who you were. If you take the American Indians, they would use names like Running Deer. Uh, and and, and it, was, it, it, it told something about who you was. It, 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 it built your character, and you lived off your character. And we should always have character before conduct. Amen? Because, see, if you don't have character before conduct, what's going to happen is what's ever in the, uh, uh, the well going to come up in the bucket. Now, you can tell everybody that you're a Christian, and, 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 and you can perform like you're a Christian, but after a while, something's going to come out. What's ever in the well going to come up in a bucket? What's ever in you? Amen? So, uh, I'm preaching again, just in case. But I'm supposed to be teaching. And, and it's hard to keep track of which one it is. But the, the, the children, these, 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 these were young children uh, uh, that had been appointed. And the king wanted to take them and wanted to teach them the ways of the Babylonians. Amen? So, verse 5, it says, and the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourished them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now here's the names that the Bible says uh, were the names of these children, not Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. And in verse 7 it says, Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave name, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah a Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah of Abad, I mean uh, Abignego. Amen? So, the, what, what, what the king was trying to do he was trying to transform these children into something that he can use. Uh, he told the, the, uh, the master of the eunuchs, Aphanas, 
He said, uh, I want you to give them meat from my table and drink from my table. But uh, the, the, the children, these four children, they told him, uh, no, we're vegans. We're vegetarians. Bible says, uh, uses the word pulse. Amen. And, 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 and so they refuse to eat and drink from the king's table because they were confident that they had a priest, that they had a protector and the provider called Jehovah God. That's what they was working on. Well, you know, we start looking at the situation today of where we are here in America, in the world. We are facing a pandemic of unquestionable proportions. And we have to ask ourselves again. Now, what was the question that I asked you? The question was, what are the intentions of God that are hidden in the action of the enemy? Now, in, in Isaiah, in that 10th chapter, the prophet came to Israel and told Israel, the Assyrians are going to attack you. So the people said, what should we do? The prophet said, you don't do nothing. This is happening. You're going to have captivity. A uh, cup of wrath with God has been filled up and now it's judgment and it's punishment time. Amen. We can live so out of pocket with God that God has to allow judgment to pass. Now, God is not a, a, a God of chaos. So saith the Bible. Amen. But as I told you before, God has a celestial council of beings that do his bidding. And so if God don't do anything and, 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 and we have to look, some of us have, you know, we, we've been blessed beyond measure. Uh, other people have fallen down. They have th had things happen to them, but we look at our lives and we've been blessed because we've been living a righteous life. There are things that have attempted to overcome us. There are things that go bump in the night that were designed to attack us, but God has said, nope, they're covered by the blood. It will not happen. I will not allow it to come to pass. And so God is our, not only he's our protector, he will protect us. But when we get to the point where we just decide that we're just going to be buck wild and we're going to sin, then God allows judgment to come upon us and he allows those celestial beings to have their way. All he has to do is put his hand behind his back and don't do anything. And you are in a world of trouble. Amen. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. I'm not telling you about what I what I heard. I'm telling you about what I know. I've been there. See, this, this might shock some of you, but the fact of the matter is, I ain't always been saved. Amen? Let me drink on that one. But through the grace of God, uh, I'm not what I should be. Amen? But I'm not what I used to be. And, and some of you need to be thankful for that. You didn't you, you, you know uh, Barnes before he got saved. Amen? I'm, I'm, I'm doing a lot better right now. Uh, men, we have these things called wives. Thank God for wives because they help keep us in check at times. Amen. I know during this particular time, as I was saying concerning uh, the SARS-CoV-2, better known as uh, COVID-19, uh, we're on lockdown. We're in the house. And uh, some of you may have discovered a new girlfriend or a new boyfriend in your husband because now uh, you're faced to... Uh, you're forced to uh, spend some quality time with them. Amen. And, 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 and so uh, it's testy for some. I know, you know, when you, you may have to go to work every day and then you work late and uh, maybe the, 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 the wife who's had to stay at home, she had to uh, cook, take care of the kids. When she, she get off work, she had to go home. She had to beat the kids and then she had to cook something. And, and, and now everybody uh, has to take part in it. Amen. Now, I have to put my apron on every now and then in the house uh, now just to keep things uh, uh, straight. And so now we're faced, we're forced to deal with each other. We're forced to deal with each other as husband and wives, uh, sister and brothers. If you got uh, extended family members living with you, uh, you got to deal with the children right now. Uh, everybody's got to be responsible for educating the children. 
uh, back over there in Deuteronomy, I believe somewhere around the 11th chapter, it says, now write these on the signposts of your house. So you've got a lot of time to study scripture. Now, if you haven't read the Bible, this is a very opportune time to read the entire Bible. You have nothing but time. Now, I don't mind is a devil workshop. Amen. If you take some time out and just read the Bible, you know, uh, I used to look at the Muslim. I used to sling hair in Chicago, um, 79th and Drexel. And uh, I used to watch the Muslim back in the day. This is back in, oh, the late 60s. And it was impressive about the Muslims, about how they carried themselves. Now, they didn't have too much character, but they could dress nice. You can, you can take a brother out of the street and uh, put a bow tie and a suit on and give him a bean pie, and he looked different. But like I say, they weren't living no way. But one of the things that they did was uh, every devout Muslim uh, was supposed to make a hajj to Mecca. Those of you who remember El Hajj Malik Shabazz, uh, better known as uh, Malcolm X, uh, in order to prove his devoutness, he made the Mecca, the Hajj to Mecca. And it was there that he discovered that he had been lied to all this time. Of course, now had he read the Bible, uh, Paul talked about uh, the Mohammedites, and he told him, he said, and I believe it's Galatians 4 and 30, he said, cast out the bondwoman and her child, for they shall not be heir with the child of promise. And the child of promise, we know, amen, was not the child of uh uh, the, the, the Arab woman. And so uh, this is a good time right now just to uh, just reinvent yourself with family. Spend some time with your wife and spend some time with your husband and with the children. Uh, we don't know what's around the corner with this uh, plague as it is. And it is a plague. They might call it what they want. Uh, but uh, we don't know what's around the corner and what could happen. We're here today and we're gone tomorrow, but it's good to be saved. Amen? So if you ain't saved, if there's somebody listening uh, uh, on this uh, telecast and you're not saved, tonight is a good time to get saved. The Bible says in Romans that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Just that simple. Of course, now, you, you make your confession of faith, and then uh, God would allow the Holy Spirit, that Ruach HaKodesh, to inhabit you and start changing you. Amen? I realized at one time that I was unable to save myself from self. And, 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 and then I had a work over by the Holy Ghost. Now, when you look at what we're going through today, it's testing us. It's testing our faith. It's testing family. It's testing church. And it's testing government. Now, we're required to pray for those who have charge over us. And I know that uh, at times we're frustrated with some of the leadership that we have but we're required to pray for them, and we should pray for them. We should pray that God surround them with wiser counsel than what they have. Amen? I've even at times, I pray uh, uh, for Kim Jong-un of North Korea, that God would turn him into a Christian. I think that's the best thing that could happen to Kim Jong-un, is that God just turned him into a Christian, and then he would be all right. Uh, we're praying for him right now because we're not sure of the reports, but the reports say uh, that he's sick. Uh, we, we don't wish anything upon anybody. Amen. We, we have to take the role of the master that we must, uh, uh, we must not retaliate. We mu must not have a spirit of retaliation. And the Bible says that, uh, you should, you know, if, uh, we should turn the other cheek. So see, that does not mean that, um, we should let somebody beat upon us. Mm -mm, no. The, uh, the, the, the laws of man, the Bible also says we should obey the laws of man. And, and, and so, uh, and some of y'all are probably more holy than I am, but if you punch me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight back. Amen? But uh, what it meant when it says uh, turn the other cheek, it meant don't have a spirit of retaliation. 
Don't sit and let that thing cook on you and then think about revenge. Because if you try to get if you try to get revenge, you'll never get ahead. Amen. And, and, and so we, we, we've got to we got to be a little bit more prayerful at this time. We're being tested beyond measure. Uh, many have lost so many loved ones. I was just reading of the family down in Alabama. I think we're three of nine family members who are sick. Three have already passed. Amen. And that's heartbreaking. I see all of you out there and uh, uh, the acknowledgments and the comments, and I, and I thank you for, for being with us tonight. I'm, I'm trying to stay on the lesson. You know how difficult it is to stay on the lesson. Uh, let's go over to um, let's, let's go to the, the second page. I don't know if we're going to get too much further, but we're going to continue on. Now, it says that Daniel was a student of prophecy. Now, now let me just hold up there. Uh, prophecy or to prophesy can be rendered in a couple of ways. Uh, there is to prophesy to be proclaiming. There is a foretelling, and then there is a forthtelling. Now, as I've read some of this information tonight, it's somewhat of a forthtelling. But then foretelling is a telling futuristic of something that has not happened. Now, when we look at Daniel... Uh, Daniel was a seer. He said, what are you talking about, Willis? Well, a seer is one who has the gift of prophecy, but not the office. Amen? So you take a person like Jeremiah and Isaiah. These were prophets who had not only the gift, but the office. Daniel only had the gift. That makes him a seer, all right? So, and but he was a student of prophecy. He understood prophecy. That's why uh, uh, Samuel set up the schools of prophecy at uh, Ramah, Jericho, uh, Gilgad, and several other places. The, the school of prophets was a place where the, the, uh, the prophets came to search the scriptures, especially the roles of Isaiah. Uh, and then, then they would see if the, the, whatever vision that they thought they had, they would check it with the scripture to see if it was the Lord. So you got to be very careful about this thing, even with uh, so-called speaking in tongue. Now there's glossolalia, which is called, uh, in a Greek glossolalia, is uh, the tongue of angels. And then there's ecstatic speeches. Not all ecstatic speech is of God. Paul warned about that. Uh, back there in Roman, where he's talking about sometime in some time past, we were led about. He was talking about spirits because in the, in that time over in Corinth, in the place of where it was, Corinth was the New York of the time back then, and it was terrible. That's why Corinth, he got uh, uh, Paul had to tell him to tell the women to shut up. Now Paul wasn't telling women that they can't talk. It was just a chaotic situation, and Paul wasn't there, so he wrote a letter and he just said, "Well, just in order to deal with it." Just let them uh, learn from their husband. But he was not telling women that they couldn't teach or preach. We got too many instances where uh, in the Bible where even a donkey spoke. If God can make a donkey talk, then he can make anybody talk for him. Amen? Where was I? I was talking about prophecy. But, but anyway, a prophecy, there's a foretelling and a foretelling. And so now Daniel is indicating to us that he was a student of prophecy, meaning that he was studying the scripture because here he was just a young kid and he wanted to understand better Jehovah God, Hashem. They call him Hashem. That's what the Jews call him. And he wanted to better understand it because now he finds himself in a strange situation and he's trying to help himself get through. Not only help, help himself get through, but now he's responsible for Hananiah, Michael and Azariah. And so now he, uh, uh, Daniel was a student of prophecy that gave him the ability to embrace the right spiritual posture that began the process of deliverance for God's people. So you have to see that Daniel was not a self-made individual at this time. We're, none of us are self-made. Uh, I can remember all the people that I grew up with. I grew up in the church. And the many people who made a deposit in me saw something in me that I didn't see. And even after leaving the church and moving and going on, 
uh, God placed uh, strategic people in my life. Um, even now, uh, Pastor Miller. Pastor Miller, he's a good man, and he's able to uh, uh, keep the Lord before us. You can't talk to Pastor Miller. You can't have a conversation with him without him preaching. He's going to preach. He cannot help himself. That's what he does. He is a preacher's preacher. And, 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 and so uh, there are many people around us today that is helping shape us and mold us into whom we're going to be. None of us are self-made, even though we like to tell ourselves that, but we're not. And, and, and we're not for the grace of God. Where will we be? Amen? So in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel begins to pray a very long prayer of supplication and repentance. He does not just repent for his own sin, but he confesses and takes ownership for the sins of the nation. This is the prayer of an intercessor. All right. How many of us, and don't raise your hands, how many of us just pray for us and our immediate family? That's a question. How many of us extend prayer out of our own home, out of our own boundary to include others? It's hard for me to sit and hear of the calamities another of others and not issue up some kind of prayer. Or oh, it's not one of those long prayers where you're getting where the only place that you should be seen doing and you shouldn't be seen doing it, you're in your in your closet. But it's a prayer. It's, it's it's where you speak to God on the behalf of another. I don't care who it is. It's everybody is hurting. Everybody has got something going on with them. Now, your hurt is not my hurt, but we all got a hurt. So you pray for me and I'll pray for you. And and, and when you go to God and, and, you, and you pray for me, uh, mention me by name. I don't want to get lost in the mix. Uh, I need prayer. I'm going to tell you, I need prayer. Uh, I'm, 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 you know, uh, I'm not going to be sheepish about this thing. We all need prayer if we admit it or not. But uh, this is the prayer of an intercessor. The prayer of supplication and repentance becomes a stirring lamentation and shows us the activity of a true intercessor. He aligns himself with the transgressor and owns up to the iniquity that led to the captivity. Now, remember the question that I asked you. And you should be constantly asking yourself this question on a regular basis. When something happens to you, don't tell yourself all the time that they out to get me. It's the ungodly trying to get me. No. What, what are the intentions of God that is hidden in the action of the enemy? See, here's the way God works. You got your enemies already around you. You don't even know who they are, but they're there. And see, when you mess up, God just let them come in on you like a flood. Amen. And, and, and you, when you look at Israel, uh, David had killed all the enemies of Israel except one, just that one, Assyria. And then when David messed up, the Assyrians came on. There are enemies waiting around you, and, but God is staying the hand of the enemy against you because you're living right. This is not the time to get buck wild. Oh, well, pastor won't see me and I won't see him for a while. Yeah, but guess what? God sees you. You have to remember the teaching of your pastor. You have to remember that which he has deposited in him so that you can get through this thing. It's not a time to fall down. Amen. As I said, like I like to write down uh, uh, what pastor is saying because I don't have a photographic memory. And every now and then, I like to go back to it. And as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I want to be able to marry preaching and teaching. Amen? Uh, we shouldn't be divided in our preaching and teaching. It should support the gospel. It should support the people. And we should basically be saying, what thus saith the Lord? Now, you're not going to know what thus saith the Lord if uh, you're not going to spend some time with the Lord. This thing, it's, it's going to take you some time. I was 50 years old when I got my PhD, and I'm still learning every day. Uh, uh, it's, it's sort of like 
uh, you thought you knew, but you don't know, you know. We, we, we still have to, and, and reading the Bible, there comes a time when you can read something and right, right then you won't get the revelation. But later on, that thing will come to you, it'll just be crystal clear and you'll know it. And see, once you've been convicted like that, you can preach and teach with authority. Can't nobody change your mind once you get that, 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 that type of, of conviction, amen? Once we get convicted, it's all over. We know what to do. Now, uh, Daniel says here on the second page, he says, therefore, will I divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he had poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressor and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressor. Actually, this is from Isaiah 53 and 12. Uh, the scripture in Isaiah is a prophecy about Jesus. At some time in all our preaching and teaching, we should mention Jesus. We shouldn't just be mouthing words, but we need to we need to mention the author and file it. What, what it says is an author and finisher, but in, in that Greek is it's written a file leader, which means that we should be getting behind Jesus and doing what Jesus do. Now, one of the ministers, uh, one of the uh, the tags, the license tags say, what would Jesus do? Well, we ask ourselves, but then again, we can buck the Holy Spirit. We won't do anything. We'll go do something else. Amen? What would Jesus do is Jesus would teach the people. As I said, he taught 85% of the time and he only preached 15% of the time. We're not starving for any preaching. What we need is teaching. Amen? And, and it's teaching is where we get understanding. Preaching is a monologue. But teaching is a dialogue. There's a dialogue where we can have a conversation where we can discuss what thus saith the Lord. We can do like Samuel when he designed the uh, the schools of prophecy. It is it's, you know, it's, it's just about that time. My time had run out. I had a little bit more, but I want to save something for the person that's coming behind me. Uh, again, uh, Minister Kara Clark, I want to thank you for all your hard work with me that was able to get me up to this point where uh, we can stream. We had a few technological glitches, and I understand what that was. The enemy just didn't want to be told. But thank God, through the prayers of the saints, we got through it. Uh, all you saints that you have turned in and tuned on, um, we thank God for each and every one of you. Remember to stay in prayer. Uh, remember who you are and who you are. And at the end of this, uh, we will... Uh, meet back at the church. And then if not, then I will see you all on the other side. God bless you and good night.